The importance of raising concerns at work in the public interest, known as whistleblowing, is beginning to be seen in a more positive light for the improvements this can trigger in health and social care organisations. It can lead to better practice and outcomes when the concerns of staff, the people who use services and carers are listened to and acted upon. Well, there's an important discussion going on about whistleblowing. If I look over my career in the late 90s, I think there was very little discussion about whistleblowing. But since uh, Robert Francis's inquiry into relation to mid Staffordshire, these issues have quite properly received much more con uh, uh, focus and, and discussion. The public know that they themselves may well end up in a care home um, and needing social care or their relatives. They want staff to raise concerns if they have them, so things can be put right at an early stage. So I think we're actually in the middle of quite a big sea change, really, in terms of attitudes to whistleblowers and recognising the value of what they do. I think the key issue for this is I, I think whistleblowing is um, a, a, a symbol, a signal of an organisation that's failed to listen to the concerns of its staff. And therefore I think the thing that we need to get right in health and social care is how do organisations listen to the concerns that their staff are raising around quality and safety. Another indication of the changes taking place is the Department of Health's 2014 National Guidance for People Who Work in the Sector, produced by the Whistleblowing Helpline. I think the key message is that raising concerns should be seen as part of normal day-to-day -day working practice. There's different sections in the guidance. One section is for workers, how they can raise concerns properly. There's also a section for managers in helping managers to respond appropriately, which involves thanking the whistleblower for raising the concerns, even if they think they're mistaken, um, to take their concerns seriously, listen to them, and to do a proper investigation. You know, they shouldn't shoot the messenger, they should look at the information. Many organisations will have procedures in place, and good practice is to first raise concerns internally. I would advise staff to, you know, to locate their organisation's whistleblowing policy and that will normally set out the process of who they should disclose information to. It will typically be their own line manager unless there's a very strong reason why they feel they can't do that. Maybe they feel if the manager or, you know, is implicated in the wrongdoing, um, then they can go to their manager's manager. But there will come a point when internal procedures are exhausted or if their concern is exceptionally serious and they feel that even the top senior managers are aware of the wrongdoing um, and choose to ignore it, then they co can go beyond to a regulator. The principal regulator in social care is the Care Quality Commission. The 1998 Public Interest Disclosure Act has also been strengthened to protect whistleblowers from harassment and bullying and they can now report concerns to their MP. But whistleblowing to the media remains highly contentious. They need to take advice, preferably um, legal advice. There are certain risks to um, their employment if they go to the media, certainly unless they've made attempts to raise um, concerns internally first. Um, if their concerns are exceptionally serious, then they may be protected Whistleblowing to the media isn't easy, as Dr Raj Matu found out. He went public after his concerns about patient deaths in overcrowded bays at the hospital where he worked were not dealt with. To whistleblow is a, is a, is a huge act, especially to whistleblow in the public domain. For me personally, that was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. But Dr Matu's actions were treated as an employment dispute rather than a whistleblowing case by the hospital management. Senior management failed to focus on the issues he raised and lost the opportunity to learn as an organisation. You end up finding yourself being totally ostracised, demoralised, and in my case, I was suspended. It's important to recognise that my experiences are not unique in the National Health Service. There are many other whistleblowers who have spoken to me over the 13 years I've been suspended, and it's remarkable the, the 
common theme that runs through them. In 2014, a tribunal cleared Dr Matu of wrongdoing, stating it was not an employment dispute and that he had whistleblown correctly by exhausting internal procedures before he went public. I think it's an absolute requirement that the culture is changed and that whistleblowing is seen as a positive thing. And I hope that in time we will have a situation where whistleblowers will stop being seen as the problem, people will stop trying to shoot the messenger and actually start seeing whistleblowers as part of the solution. We need to stop looking at the whistleblower. We need to start looking at the manager. Right? We know the whistle we know people raise concerns, sometimes against all odds. People have concerns and they talk about them. Maybe they don't raise it to management, but they talk about it about those concerns among themselves. So what you need to start looking at is what makes managers listen to concerns and what holds them from listening to concerns. Some care organisations are exploring new ways to respond to whistleblowers. As in this case from the Wirral, after a student nurse raised concerns with her university tutor. The types of issues which she was raising were to do with medicine administration, manual handling, how people were generally being cared for, and also how they were being communicated with. She didn't perceive that the experiences were very compassionate or caring from the staff there. She reported it to the manager who was at the placement and she didn't feel that the issues were being taken seriously while she was at that placement. So she felt that she wasn't being listened to. Pat Clark reported these concerns to the Wirral Social Services. The response was immediate. The care home was investigated and working with the local NHS Care Commissioning Group, an action plan was put in place. It was a surprise. I think that the surprise was the extent or the range of difficulties from, you know, not answering a buzzer to actual alleged assault um, and, you know, varying degrees in between. We're quite taken aback that we didn't realise, if you like, it, it was a warning shot uh, to, to the organisation. Social services and the CCG's adult safeguarding team then set about learning lessons from the incident. For example, new quality self-assessment forms were introduced to help improve standards across 108 care homes. The documents themselves contain a series of questions, staffing requirements, staff training, supervision, actual environment, what is the environment like for a resident who lives in that home, um, is it safe? We have an, an open door policy at Daleside which I find very important for all staff carers, residents, relatives and visiting professionals. Any concerns raised, no matter how big or small, can always have a positive impact on our future practice if we learn from them. There's been a cultural shift towards listening more carefully to concerns and student nurses on placements have been encouraged to take a more proactive role. The message really for me would be we need to take any concerns raised through whistleblowing seriously and follow them up, even though, as is this case, we thought at first, surely not all those things could not be going on in the home, when in fact the majority of them were. For whistleblowing to work in organisations, it takes more than top management wanting to listen to concerns. You need to have communication that shows people, that tells people these people have come forward with their concern, here's how they raised their concern and look this is how we were able to improve our services. That's the kind of communication you need. Managers should be encouraging staff to raise concerns at an early stage um, and to do so through routine processes like supervisions, like through appraisals, through team meetings. They need to make it happen. 
and they do that through performance management, through making their middle managers somehow accountable for listening to concerns. So the, you need to have a kind of a performance measurement system. I mean, people behave towards what is being measured. The key issue that we're looking for uh, when we inspect services, and this is a part of our new methodology, uh, we'll be asking the question how well led organisations are and what we'll be looking for there is how open and transparent are organisations. Anna Patterson is an owner manager of a home care agency where care workers visit people in their homes. How does she foster a spirit of openness? If you encourage an open culture it's, it makes your life much easier as, as the leader because people will be forever having good ideas because if they see something they're not going to see it as oh let's hide that um, you know uh, they, they're going to immediately going to say flag it up and come to you I mean like for instance I had somebody the other, the other day because we have such a culture when she made a mistake she immediately came and said look I made a mistake but I'm looking at ways of how I'm going to correct it if she'd hidden that that could have gone on notice but then laid there underneath the surface and could have created more problems for us it's a much more I would say a more um, happier environment that people can live in. People don't feel as if they need to look over their shoulders all the time. I think people feel, I think it would make people feel more comfortable.